We're talking today with Bill Rinderknecht of Kentwood, Michigan, uh, who, in addition to being a veteran, is also the owner of a multimedia production company, so he knows something about being in the studio. Uh, the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, be Bill, begin with some background on yourself and to start with, you know, where and when were you born? Sure. I was born and spent most of my life before the Air Force around Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, we had three years on a farm in uh, northwest Missouri when I was very young, but most of my uh, life was spent in rural Indiana. Okay. And what was your family doing for a living when you were growing up? My father, in between farming, was a uh, pattern maker for Chevrolet trucks in Indianapolis. And I was one of five siblings. Growing up near Indianapolis, we loved the Indy 500, of course, and watched that as often as we could, and were into Hoosier hysteria every February and March, the basketball, which was a single class, single elimination tournament that was unique to the state. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was uh, my growing up years. I was involved in uh, a lot of music. I, uh, I sang. Uh, we and we were involved. Or we were involved in in uh, musicals and choir and uh, show band and show choir and things like that. Those were early memories for me. A lot of creativity in that time, and I was an athlete as well. I ran track and cross country, okay. and then. Now, when did you finish high school? I graduated from Danville Community High School in uh, 1967. Okay. And I stayed close by and worked for a couple of local newspapers until I enlisted. All right. Now, you graduate in 67. By then, Vietnam is, is, is going pretty much full steam. Were you paying attention to that or the prospect of being drafted? Yes, I was. Uh, in direct answer to that question, I, my father, I respected his military service from World War II although, like many veterans of that war, he didn't talk about it much. And I thought that I, I knew I would need to go into the military because my draft number would come up at some point. And so I chose the Air Force because I didn't want to crawl around in the mud of Vietnam. So I enlisted in the Air Force in August of 1968. Okay. Uh, now. What kind of processing do you go through once you go into enlist? I guess, first of all, uh, was the Air Force taking anybody who was signing up or? Well, we had to take, uh, they call it, an, uh, I'm trying to remember the initials, but it was an aptitude test mm -hmm. for the Air Force. And uh, I scored pretty well in all four areas, but um, I scored well enough that they, they accepted my application for enlistment. Okay. And so I swore in in uh, Indianapolis and then within a few days I was on an airplane to Texas. All right. Uh, now did you um, have, oh, did you sign up for three years or four years? I uh, enlisted for four. Okay. Uh, and if you're willing to go for four that probably also helps. But uh, In some of the services it did in the Air Force uh, it didn't help me at all. Okay. Um, I I went into basic with no stripes, and um, I was, I had one stripe coming out of, uh, of basic. At that time, they called it Airman Third Class. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what does Air Force basic training consist of at that point? Um, Air Force history, the, uh, obviously, rules and regulations, Air Force policy, uh, athletic uh, endeavors, obstacle course, et cetera. And when I compare it to what the other services had to go through, especially the Army and the Marines, uh, they would probably call it a walk in the park. <laughs> but uh, it was still pretty intense. We had uh, drill instructors who, uh, who were very intense and rode us hard for six weeks. Okay. Uh, what kind of emphasis was there on discipline and following orders? Um, extreme. Uh, we 
we're out of bed at no, at five every morning, lights out at night at, uh, at nine, mm -hmm. and uh, every morning we uh, we got up, made our beds crisply so that they could bounce a quarter off our blanket, and um, and then we would either do PT first or we would do uh, morning chow and classes and then PT. It just depended on their their uh, whims. Mm -hmm. And we took our turn staying up at night, pulling guard over over our individual barracks. Okay. We probably had two people wash out for mental issues. They just, they didn't fit according to the authorities. Okay. Now how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to that or how long did it take to get used to it? Well, my dad was quite the disciplinarian, so I knew how to follow directions. Mm -hmm. And so I adjusted to it within probably a week or two. Uh, got into the flow, the routine. Um, I knew I knew when to do what. They told us every move to make and when to make it, so that was not hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after six weeks, I was uh, ready to move on. Okay. Uh, and now, for Air Force, normally there's going to be some kind of training school or program after the basic that's training. That's so what did they send you to do? Well, um, I, when I got to basic training, I thought that I wanted to be a photographer, and that's kind of ironic because I'm a videographer mm -hmm. now. But um, they didn't tell us anything for weeks. In about the fourth week, I was sent over to the optometrist's office, and they gave me a colorblindness test. And at that point, I began to wonder what that could mean, and finally somebody revealed to me that I would be something called a photo interpreter. In those days we didn't use the term imagery much. So my Air Force specialty code became 20610 which was photo interpretation. And so in o October 15th of 68 I left to go to Denver, Colorado where, where I went to Lowry Air Force Base and within three weeks, I think, of what they call casual status, I started class. So when you're in casual status, you've got no real assignments and they make up things for you to do? Well, yes, as a matter of fact. Fortunately, like I said, I was a vocalist then, mm -hmm. and I joined what was called the Tech School Chorus at Lowry, and award-winning choir. There's uh, nothing but men in it, and I migrated from my general barracks where life was a little hard because they had student leaders who were managing us and and every once in a while they would get on what what we would call a power surge and and uh, and overstep their authority and make it make life rough on us so i moved into the choir barracks and life was a lot better at that <laughs> point still had to starch my clothes spit and polish the whole thing. However, it was a much, it was a much nicer environment for me being a creative and, and, uh, uh, and being able to sing whenever. So I went through tech school, the photo interpretation course, and then in April of 69, I went to my first assignment. Okay. Talk a little bit about the photo interpretation itself. What are you actually being taught to do? We, they, they taught us that when we went to Southeast Asia or where, whatever assignment, we would be looking at photography. We would look at uh, either uh, uh, transparent negatives or transparent positive film. And from the airplanes that would fly over the uh, battlefield and take their pictures. And so I would look at the uh, photography, if you will, at that at that time, and determine what was on the ground. They taught us how to see things, how to discriminate between man-made and natural. What's an, uh, what kind of industry? I mean, they taught us everything about looking at enemy equipment and potential uh, industry identification as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long was that school? Mm, I was in Denver for about nine months. Okay. 
So that's quite a while. Now, uh, in, in the meantime, are you still doing the singing and that kind of thing? Or that All the time. Yeah. We just, we so enjoyed ourselves. We, we did performances at the Broadmoor, which is down in, uh, down in Colorado Springs. We performed locally. We did charity things, et cetera, et cetera. Developed some, uh, developed some good relationships with the other members of the choir. We had a great time. Okay. All right. Uh, and so in a lot of ways was this um, more like a, almost a regular job or something and, and not so much like it being was, in training? Yeah, it was close to that. Um, w I was having a good time at this at the same time I was going to school six hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of funny when I left basic training, I thought I was going to go to something like a college, mm -hmm. you know, and we're going to we're going to relax, we're going to go to class, have a lot of time off, etc. Mm -hmm. But it didn't quite work out that way. The only the 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 good times I had outside of class were all associated with the choir. Right. OK, uh, so then now let's see. Move us on then. Okay, so then you're, now you go to your next assignment. Well, when I left tech school in April of 69, I went to South Carolina, near where my mother grew up, actually. Uh, so I was able to see a lot of family there. But that was my first assignment. It was the uh, 3, 363rd TAC Recon Wing, Tactical Reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. And we um, practiced looking at imagery, bridges, dams, roads, industries, and then we would, uh, we would go through other training at the same time to ensure that we didn't lose our edge on identifying enemy aircraft and enemy armed force material. Okay. Now, where in South Carolina were you based? That was in uh, Sumter, South Carolina, Shaw Air Force Base. Okay. It was an hour from Columbia and about an hour and a half from my grandmother's home. Okay. Uh, now, would you fly out over the Atlantic, or would they, they do reconnaissance over the, the ocean? The pilots too? would fly out to the coast, but it was mostly anywhere that they could be out and back within an hour and a half. Okay. So it was pretty much over land. Interesting story. Uh, at those times, the feds were busting moonshine stills. Mm hmm and one of the things we did was look at imagery of the mountains in North Carolina, and we would identify moonshine stills. <laughs> so that's practice of the sort. Uh, Indeed. All right. Now, was this um, ASIM, was a lot of what they were doing kind of training people or preparing them to go to Southeast Asia and do this sort of thing? That is correct. Uh, there, it was a Tactical training is what they called it for us. Um, we had mobile photo processing and interpretation facilities. Um, they said the PIF, photo processing and interpretation facility, mm -hmm. mobile, and we would practice uh, tearing them down and setting them up. They were vans a little bit shorter than a semi-trailer and olive drab and, and inside, they, they had kind of a configuration that you would find inside a, uh, a motor home. Mm -hmm. they would be, there would be sinks, processors, uh, light tables on which we looked at uh, negatives and positive film, and, um, and all the other accoutrements that you could imagine for filing reports, transmitting them, et cetera. And everything was, everything was nailed down before we broke down the van and put the wheels on and drove it to the other side of the airfield and set it up again. Mm -hmm. we, would, we practiced that quite a bit. Okay, now was this thing air conditioned? Yes, as a matter of fact, that was. That was a, that was a good part of my experience because so many people were out in the hot sun uh, uh, maintaining aircraft or uh, pulling guard duty or doing whatever outside, and we were inside in the air conditioning, so that was good. 
Right. Okay. Now you spend your time. You spent the time uh, in, in Colorado at Lowry, and, and now you're in, in South Carolina. And this is a period when, in the country, the larger anti-war movement is, is definitely taking up and, and gathering a lot of steam. Uh, now, does any? Are you, do you see much of that, or does any of that affect you, or is that all someplace else? Um, in Denver, when I was in school. Uh, see, Denver itself was a little more liberal than uh, South Carolina yeah. was. And we were not treated with respect in Denver. Mm -hmm. um, but when I went to South Carolina, I didn't hear a peep about anti-war. Um, and so that did not affect me so much. There were a, a few airmen who were discontented. Mm -hmm. They had to join the military in some fashion. And there were, there were those who were obviously against the war and outspoken about it, at least in the day room with other airmen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it's out there, but it's not too intrusive for you in your life at that point? Not really. Okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't let that kind of thing affect me. I had, to do, I had a job to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know enough about the war at that point to have any real opinion about pro or con. I knew mm -hmm. I was in the military and I was going to serve. Right. Okay. Uh, so after South Carolina now, what's your next assignment? I went back to Denver for three weeks for Southeast Asia orientation. They uh, told us about Vietnam, about other countries in Southeast Asia, the kinds of things to expect what to avoid, um, how to manage life in that environment. And then uh, I left there, I think I, I think I had vacation. I had took leave at home mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks and then and flew to San Francisco and then hopped to Hawaii, uh, Clark Air, Force Air Base in the Philippines and then, and then into Thailand. All right, so when do you arrive in Thailand? Uh, November of uh, 1969, and I was there for 11 months. Okay. Uh, now, where in Thailand were you based? Udon Rachatani was the name of the town. It was Udorn Air Force Base, mm -hmm. where I where I stayed. Um, the we didn't have the PIF like I had in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, we we were in Quonset huts. I was assigned to the 11th. TAC Recon Squadron, and we had a sister squadron, the 14th, and we we're all part of the uh, 463rd Wing, I believe. They had, it was composite. They had the fighters and they had the reconnaissance airplanes. Mm -hmm. And so we, in our Quonset hut with our light tables and our photo processing equipment, um, would look at film that came back. Uh, that was downloaded from the aircraft that had just returned either over Vietnam or they would fly over Laos and uh, to do reconnaissance. And my primary job was, uh, number one, uh, get a debrief from the pilots. They would tell me where they flew and I would look at the imagery to confirm that they actually flew that route. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that was another thing we learned is to track aircraft. Looking at milestones and land formations, we could tell where they actually flew. And so my primary job was looking for anti-aircraft equipment along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Mm -hmm. And if we found it, then the fighters from the same wing would go out and neutralize them. That was, that was pretty much it for a year. I was looking for air defenses. Okay. Now, was there a problem with pilots claiming to have gone places they didn't go? Only once or twice did I discover through imagery that they hadn't flown exactly where they thought they did. But, it, but for them, it was an honest mistake. Okay. So it wasn't as if, oh, I'm, I'm going to say I fly, I'm going to fly there. I'm not going to fly there because they're going to shoot at me or... Oh, no. Anything, nothing like anything that. Anything like they, that. They, they did their job. Okay. What kind of aircraft were they using? It was called the RF-4C uh, Phantom II. Uh, the, the F-4 was multifunctional. The Navy first decided they wanted it mm -hmm. uh, for 
uh, flights off of an aircraft carrier, and the Air Force followed right behind and bought their own. Uh, we had fighter bombers, we had, and we had reconnaissance aircraft. There were quite a few models of the F-4, mm -hmm. but the recon uh, aircraft was R-4C. Okay, but that's a, so. But basically, it's sort of a modified version of the same aircraft that's used as a fighter and fighter bomber, correct? By others, as opposed to something that's specially designed just as an observation plane. That that is correct. Okay, all right. Uh, now, was that was flying? As far as you can tell, was was that dangerous? Were you losing aircraft? We, I could count on one hand the number of aircraft that we actually lost. Mm -hmm. One story that. Uh, became very personal to me was I knew I knew uh, certain people in the television station at Udorn Air Force Base and one of the aircraft one of the reconnaissance aircraft had been flying over the the China Laos highway because the Chinese were building a highway into Vietnam through Laos and while on the mission an aircraft, uh, one of our reconnaissance aircraft was hit by 37 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft weaponry. Uh, around hit their right engine. And they thought they could make it home, and they did make it all the way back to the base, but uh, they, as they were trying to land, they lost control. They bailed out. Both crewmen survived, but the aircraft inverted and crashed into the television station, killing nine people there. Mm -hmm. um, that's as close as I came to death and destruction during the Vietnam War. Okay. Now, the uh, labs where you work, are those air conditioned? Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, we had um, modified PIF vans mm -hmm. in the back where uh, all the film was processed, and within, f within 45, half hour to 45 minutes, the film was off the aircraft, through the processor, and on my light table. And then 45 minutes after that, I would put out my first report. Okay. All right. Now, uh, and then, so how large a team did you work with, or? <sighs> there must have been 25 imagery interpreters mm -hmm. that I rubbed shoulders with. Okay. Uh, and we operated in shifts. Um, w a crew would come in relatively early. They might be there at, at sunup, and after a morning reconnaissance flight, the film would come in and they would interpret it, and then I would usually come in in the afternoons, uh, 3, 30, 4 o'clock, and I would work till midnight or until all the reports were out. Okay. All right. Uh, and now, what were the physical accommodations there like? Where do you sleep? And eat? Um, it was what they called open bay barracks. Um, I could, I could see someone sleeping at the other end of the, of the dorm, if you will. And we did not have air conditioning in the barracks, but we, but we were screened in and fans going all the time. We never really got that hot. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was down to 50 degrees in December, which was, you know, it got kind of cold for some of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then um, do you have, and are, the, are the barracks sort of permanent buildings or are they? Yes, they were. Um, couldn't tell you what had become of them since we left. Mm -hmm. But um, interesting uh, culture stories. We would ride the bot bus, which is about the size of a Volkswagen van, and it was and it was open, and uh, I rode up to uh, Nong Kai, which was right on the Mekong River across the, across the river from Vientiane in Laos, mm -hmm. and and on our way back in April of '70, uh, it was the water festival, and we were drenched. Uh, that's the end of the dry season, mm -hmm. and they have a, uh, the water festival celebration where everybody gets wet, and we did too. Okay, uh, now, and would you go off base much? I tried to. Uh, sometimes I was out of bounds. Um, 
you, they didn't they didn't want us to go farther than 10 miles and probably four times I went 60 miles or further. Mm -hmm. I went west once, I went to went up to Nankai, which was kind of borderline, and I went south to Konkin and uh, but I spent most of my time either on the base or in, or in town. Okay. Learned to like Thai food. All right. Uh, now, were there uh, any security concerns? <clears throat> were there potentially any, you know, guerrillas out there or anyone else that might, or criminals or people who might make trouble for you? The month before I got there, they had an, uh, an attempted breach of the perimeter. Um, but the whole time I was there, uh, we never had a threat. Mm -hmm. So it was relatively calm and safe environment for me personally. I didn't worry about much in terms of my safety. Okay. Uh, now, in a place like Thailand, there were a variety of temptations and, and distractions available for American military personnel off these bases. Indeed. Um, and so you had drinking, you had women, you had drugs, uh, a variety of stuff going on. Uh, to what extent were you aware of that? Well, I was certainly tempted and distracted, um, and uh, I didn't get into the drug scene, but I spent my share of time downtown. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there were, it seemed like every, every bar that we visited, there were uh, lots of ladies there who wanted to make a GI happy. Right. Now, did some of the men <clears throat> on the base uh, live off base or have regular girlfriends off base? Yes, uh, some did, and they called the girl the T-lock, which was loosely translated, it was a, a girlfriend, and they, mm -hmm. would, uh, they would shack up for weeks or months. Um, in fact, when I was still in South Carolina, there was a man there who had been to Thailand, and he s began my prep for mm -hmm. going over there when I found out I was going. And he had a tea lock. In fact, he loved her and he wanted to go back to Thailand and bring her back to the States. Mm -hmm. And a few others did. Um, but mostly we just came home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and were, were drugs an issue on the base at all? Mm, I couldn't say for sure I knew it was happening, okay. but I, I never heard of anybody that, that was uh, arrested mm -hmm. because of drugs. And, and I think if they were, they would be quietly disposed of and the general population wouldn't hear about it much. Right. I drank my share of beer though. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you, you're not aware, say, that, that, that heroin was creating a problem or anything else like that at that point? No. Yeah. There's a certain phase where it does in Vietnam, I think it's just a little bit later maybe than there. But you're there, 69, kind of through most through, 1970. Through October 70. Okay, and during that time, uh, you've got the Cambodian incursion going on. That's true. And did you do interpretation of photography for that, or were you did just... Did not. Okay. Did not, actually. Um, uh, the airplanes that I was on, whose film I was reviewing, all either flew over Laos or uh, South Vietnam. They didn't, even, they didn't even get into North Vietnam. We had units in uh, Da Nang, mm -hmm. Vietnam, and other places where, uh, whose mission was to fly over North Vietnam. Okay, so you're, it's all very kind of compartmentalized. You've got this job, this area, and if nothing is happening in that area, and not. Now, there was Indeed, an, that's true. another substantial operation going on in the northern part of South Vietnam, and this might have been covered by the Da Nang people uh, around a fire base called Ripcord, but that was inside South Vietnam. I didn't get a lot of information about uh, South Vietnam unless it showed up in the Stars and Stripes, of okay. course. Okay. Newspaper, and I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to that. I, I was a self-centered kid, mm -hmm. and I was into doing my own thing. And if it involved music, great. Um, I went to Catholic mass 
uh, on Sunday afternoons um, as a matter of convenience, really, as a uh, time to get to know other people. Uh, we did have a retreat down at Patia Beach, which is uh, south of Bangkok. Mm -hmm. um, that was you know, one of the few times I actually got that far off the base. But um, religion was a convenience to me. I loved my beer, and I loved to go downtown. And that was, um, there were probably dangers I wasn't aware of mm -hmm. that God protected me from. Okay. Uh, now, now you you'd had the, the the trip down to the beach. Did you go out of the country at all during that time? Didn't I didn't leave Thailand. Okay. Uh, there were sponsored trips over to Chiang Mai, which is a very gorgeous city up in northwest Thailand, and mm -hmm. I never got to take advantage of that. All right. Uh, now, as your tour comes to an end, are you ready to go home, or would you have stayed longer? <sighs> I was really ready to leave. I was getting so lonesome for my family. I was able to talk to my mother. They had uh, a radio connected to landline in the States, mm -hmm. you know, shortwave radio to landline to talk to my parents. And so that would involve the price of a long distance call within the States. Mm -hmm. And so I got to talk to them a few times. But um, I, I got real lonely. Okay. All so right. glad to be home. Now, um, you wind up uh, having an extended career in, in the Air Force. At what point that did is you correct. decide that you wanted to stay in? <clears throat> um, I, would have, I would have separated in uh, August of 1972. Mm -hmm. So. I, I was in um, I was in Idaho at Mountain Home Air Force Base for about a year, and I was real after having been in Southeast Asia and then coming back to to the environment in the states. I I was a little I was discontent, mm -hmm. and I was into the uh, I was into the music of the time, mm -hmm. uh, Neil Young, uh, the Beatles, um, others. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, et cetera, et cetera, and um, and that that sort of plays on your mentality a little bit, I think. But I was also lonely and I was discontent and I uh, didn't know what I wanted to do, so uh, I stuck with it and uh, I got married there and was assigned to Texas for a couple of years. And in 1972. Um, a retired chief master sergeant at a J.C. Penney Tire Center convinced me that uh, an Air Force career is not is not such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So I re-enlisted there, um, and uh, went through the same kind of tactical training environment in Texas that I had in had uh, undertaken there in uh, South Carolina. Okay, just to back up a little bit, so was the Idaho assignment the place they sent you after you come back from Thailand? That is correct. Okay, and what were you doing there? Essentially the same thing, again, that I was doing in South Carolina. We, the, the aircraft did practice runs, they took imagery, brought it back, and we, uh, our exercise was to process and and analyze and read out the imagery as soon as we could. Mm -hmm. And so to hone our skills, to make sure that we didn't lose our edge. Okay, and what was the environment in Idaho like? I mean, were you in the middle of nowhere or close to a larger town? Or? Yeah, I found that many air, many air fields were positioned 10, side out, uh, 10, 10 miles outside of the nearest city. Mm -hmm. And Mountain Home, Idaho, the city, was not that big either. Mm -hmm. And so we would uh, take a 70 mile trip up to Boise if we wanted any action. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> um, there were things to do in Boise and I met my, I met my first wife there at a, at a Shakey's Pizza Parlor one mm -hmm. night. And, uh, and so we got married in August of 71 before we left to go to Texas. Okay. All right, uh, and then where were you based in Texas? Near Austin at Bergstrom Air Force Base. Interesting thing about my assignments, um, when I left Shaw, 
they were uh, in the process of decommissioning my squadron. There were other squadrons there, but they decommissioned it. When I left Thailand, they were decommissioning the 11th TAC Recon Squadron because at that point, there was a sense in which the war had already started to wind down, right. being 1970. And when I left Mountain Home, Idaho, they decommissioned my squadron there and replaced it with F-111s, uh, fighter bombers, sw the swing wing aircraft mm -hmm. that are no longer in the inventory either. And I went to Texas for two years, and when I left Texas to go to Guam, they were decommissioning my squadron there. So at that point, the whole, the whole military was starting to draw down a little bit. Uh, involvement in Vietnam and Southeast Asia was diminishing, and, and uh, the troop forces were uh, shrinking, et cetera. Okay. Now, as you're going through these uh, assignments in the early stages of, of your career, how would you characterize the morale in the Air Force units? Um, It was more of a job than a career for most people. Okay. They would, uh, you know, 90% of the people would stay there, stay for four years and then, and then uh, get out and go do something else. In fact, in Texas, I thought about doing something else. In fact, I went to a, uh, I spent half days training for newspaper work again. Uh, I had been uh, working for a newspaper in my hometown before I joined the Air Force. So I went through six months of, they called it Operation Transition, and where I would uh, work in a print shop, learn the trade, mm -hmm. and then attempt to get a job at a local paper right. or, or whatever. And it discovered that it wasn't gonna work financially. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that, was, that was another reason that I re-enlisted. Okay. Um. But basically, uh, so the people who are there, they're doing the job, so there's, do they do their jobs effectively? Yes. Um, they had enough pride in themselves and their work to, uh, to at least fulfill the minimum requirements. Okay. Uh, I enjoyed the work I do. Um, I, I, I love to look at imagery. I have an eye for framing and, uh, and um, was really good at imagery photo interpretation mm -hmm. at that time. They changed the specialty description to imagery and analysis later. Okay, all right. So you, you do Texas and then now next, next stop is Guam? That's correct. In uh, June of 1975, uh, we moved to Guam and spent two years there. I worked for 8th Air Force and being a student of military history, you probably understand a little bit about 8th, Eighth Air Force. Um, one of our more famous commanders was uh, Bombs Away LeMay, mm -hmm. you know, Curtis LeMay, and who also became the first uh, commander-in-chief of the Strategic Air Command. Mm -hmm. So 8th Air Force was part of SAC, and I did some all source intelligence analysis. I didn't just look at pictures. Okay. We reviewed other information. And I also uh, graded arc light bomb strikes. Now the arc lights were, uh, com were composed of B-52s flying over uh, the jungle and, and bombing storage facilities, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took radar imagery and recorded that, and they also recorded uh, nine by nine inch format photos from the B-52s as they flew. And we would, uh, we would grade them, again, based on a map, a planned route, and planned target, and we would, um, we would grade them to ensure that they bombed the right locations. Now by the time you got to Guam, the Vietnam War for the Americans was over. So Pretty there, much, so 1973, that's correct. Oh, 73, oh, okay. 73, okay. so it was, yeah. uh, I left in June of 75, which is right after Okay, you finished. left in June of 75, okay, yeah. Okay. That's correct. All right, yeah, so, because we were still, officially we weren't supporting the South Vietnamese militarily by then, but were there still a few arc light strikes going on when you first got out there? Yes, 
Yes, quite a few. Uh, and I don't know if it's still classified whether we're actually bombing, but uh, but I'm sure we, the Vietnamese know. The Vietnamese, yeah, no, and other countries probably mm -hmm. know. But um, at any rate, um, near the end of my tour in Guam, the uh, people started, uh, the, Viet the South Vietnamese started escaping. Right. And uh, we had been decommissioning various barracks on the island. And at some point in the spring of 75, we began to receive uh, the Vietnamese refugees. Mm -hmm. And so our job was to refurbish uh, uh, the barracks and, uh, and put up fences because you never know who's a good guy and who's a bad guy among the refugees. And so, and so they were all sequestered in uh, a group of dormitories that had been previously decommissioned. Interesting story. I was in Virginia in 1998, and I met a lady who was a hairstylist, and she was, she was a teenager at the time of the refugee crisis, and she went through Guam. Mm -hmm. So I could have seen her when I was in Guam. I thought that was an interesting story. I mean, did you have form any, much of any impression of the Vietnamese? Did you get a good look at them? Or? Uh, we saw them from a distance. We were not allowed that close. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't know if I could gauge, accurately gauge their attitude. Mm -hmm. Or just physical condition or anything else. Uh, they seemed to be healthy enough. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as their emotional state, right, right. I, c I can only imagine what uh, someone must be going through when they have to leave their home country and mm -hmm. escape to a place that is not familiar at all and have to start a new life. That right. must have been tough. All right. Um, other things that sort of stand out for you in the time in Guam? Um, I got off the island once, did a shopping trip in Taipei, uh, bought a bit of furniture that uh, made its way into our home. And um, I played a lot of softball, and I bowled a lot, and hung out with friends. Mm -hmm. That was pretty, pretty much the extent of Guam. Okay. A lot of people got rock fever, because if you were single, you spent 15 months there. If you were married, you spent two years. And in both cases, people some people got weird because it was only eight miles by 30, 35 miles in dimensions. Not a lot of places to go. Mm -hmm. um, there was, we did some snorkeling. We had a beach right on the, uh, uh, on the airfield on Anderson Air Force Base. And so we would spend time at the beach, um, hunt hermit crabs, uh, do a little bit of fishing. So, um, that was that was pretty much Guam for me. Okay, okay. So was your wife out there with you at that point? Yes, okay. yeah, yes, she was. Since the two years for the married people, you don't that is move correct. in and out that quickly. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, so that that assignment now finishes up. Uh, where do you go next? Um, I was assigned to SAC headquarters at Offutt Air Force Base, uh, just outside of Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, that was. Uh, July of 1975, um, I left. I left my wife and two children in uh, Texas near her home, mm -hmm. and I came up myself. Uh, set up housekeeping. I got the. Um, <clears throat> uh, we we obtained on base housing, and so so then uh, so then the family joined me, and mm -hmm. we spent four years there. Um, I was in a unit called the Joint Strategic Target Planning Staff there, which um, managed uh, the uh, nuclear war plan. Uh, being SAC headquarters, this agency was also attached. 
and my job was targeting. Mm -hmm. So we would look at our Cold War opponent, mm -hmm. uh, the Russians and the Eastern Europeans, and we would establish targets and then, and then the targets would go down into the planning cell where they would determine how these targets should be neutralized in case mm -hmm. of war. So that was an interesting time. Okay. And uh, so, so like I said, I spent four years doing okay. that. Now, did uh, targets shift? I mean, were you getting new data and readjusting on any regular basis? Or? Um, yes, as a matter of fact. Um, we would refine coordinates because accuracy was key for the U.S. forces. Mm -hmm. And so we would refine the uh, locations depending on how good the maps were that we got, other imagery that we might see. Um, and, and so uh, it got rather boring after a while because I kept looking at the same things over mm -hmm. and over. But, uh, but it was still an interesting time. Um, I, uh, at, at the same time, my first marriage was breaking up. Mm -hmm. I had a, I had a uh, religious conversion experience uh, at, a, at a local uh, uh, Pentecostal church. And that changed a lot of things for me. Mm -hmm. But um, so uh, that, that marriage ended uh, there and I got remarried. And then all of a sudden I got in, uh, I was actually wanting to stay mm -hmm. in Omaha and possibly transition out of the Air Force again. I thought about leaving it mm -hmm. again. And then I got an assignment to Hawaii. And uh, I, I prayed about that and decided, okay, let's, let's do that. And so went to Hawaii for four years from Omaha. And uh, it was a great tour. Uh, I was in a, I was in another reconnaissance unit and our, mm -hmm. one of our primary focuses was in, other than keeping up with the uh, Cold War opponents, nuclear uh, weapons activity, uh, really our primary focus was on the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And spent a lot of time looking at imagery of the demilitarized zone, looking for tunnels because they had built a lot of tunnels and we were uh, neutralizing them, if you will. Mm -hmm. We'd you know, block up the south end right. and capture people who might try to come through, whatever. And so that was, that was an interesting time. Okay. Um, and what years was that? From uh, June of 79 to April of 83. Okay. And uh, it, that is also the point where I finished my college education because I had been going to class at different schools mm -hmm. uh, sort of on the fly. And I spent my last 30 hours at Wayland Baptist University, which had a campus, an extension campus, on the island of uh, Oahu. And finished my, finished my degree, applied for officer's training school, got my letters of recommendation, and and then in April of uh, 83, uh, I went to Texas again. Okay. Now, uh, while you're in Omaha and then Hawaii and so forth, are you starting to, are you using satellite imagery now or it's still reconnaissance aircraft? Um, combination of, uh, well, and pretty much satellite imagery mm -hmm. in, uh, in Omaha at okay. Offutt. And then it was a combination of satellite and uh, the U-2, the SR-71, and they were still they were still flying uh, F-4 aircraft uh, over the demilitarized zone, mm -hmm. and and so there were those aircraft missions as well. So we looked at a variety of imagery and looked at a lot of sources of information. Again, I was migrating more toward all source analysis right. at that point. Okay. Now, where do you go for the officer training? Yeah, we called it a suburb of Lackland, and Lackland was in San Antonio, mm -hmm. where I went to basic training, and they had uh, they had a a base called Medina next door to it, where uh, in 90 days you could come out as an officer. So it was rather than six weeks, it was 12 mm -hmm. for officers training, and that training was much more in depth. 
uh, much, much more related to, to management and leadership courses mm -hmm. in the Air Force context, of course. And, uh, and we had, as opposed to basic training, we had student officer positions that we could achieve. So uh, I became a student uh, or a cadet group commander. Uh, and the only, the only person above me in the pecking order was the student wing commander. And so we had two groups and one wing. Okay. Now what rank were you at when you went in? Well, I had achieved uh, E7, Air Force Master Sergeant. Mm -hmm. And so there were some people who questioned my sanity for wanting to go to officer's training school and essentially start at the bottom again as a second okay. lieutenant. Um, financially, it was a wash, however. Mm -hmm. uh, in total pay, the master sergeant and, and, the, and the E1, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the E7 and the O1 were mm -hmm. making the same. And, and I thought, I thought that it, uh, I could make some progress as an officer and right. uh, eventually retire with a nice pay. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do that because I, I felt like I had, uh, I felt like I had some leadership aptitude and I wanted to be right. able to exercise that. Okay. And so as an E6 or an E7 in the Air Force, had you been commanding people or in charge of smaller units at that time? Um, or I all? was in charge of branches mm -hmm. at that point, but, um, well, I, my major was the branch chief, but I was his senior enlisted mm -hmm. within that branch. So that's how that worked out. Okay. Now, were you one of the uh, older people in your officer training group, or were a lot of them about your age? There were probably two people in officer's training school that were older than me. Mm -hmm. In fact, fully half my class were prior enlisted, or what we called retreads. Yeah. And uh, I think Navy, maybe the Marine Corps too, call them Mustangs. Mm -hmm. But uh, so half the class was prior enlisted. and. Um, and so we were able to teach the new folks a lot of things along the way. Um, had fun with them too. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I, I graduated from officer's training school in uh, August mm -hmm. of, uh, of 1983 and went back to Colorado. I went to imagery training school again and of course that was a breeze for me having all that experience right. and so i graduated as the honor grad and they they actually gave me my choice of assignments and said can i and i said can i stay here and teach because mm -hmm. i liked denver and i thought teaching would be an interesting way to uh, impact young people mm -hmm. and um really loved colorado uh so uh, they agreed, and I stayed there for, well, from 83 to August of 87, I stayed in uh, Denver, Colorado again at Lowry. And an interesting thing, they were closing Lowry when I left. Mm -hmm. another, another unit is being decommissioned <laughs> as I'm leaving. I said, I guess, I guess they can't live without me. I don't know what the deal is. No, I, seriously. Their, their plan was to move the school down to Texas. Uh, in a, in a oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the city, but Goodfellow Air Force Base mm -hmm. consolidated all of the Air Force training uh, for intel. Yeah, now that's a substantial kind of Air Force or Air Museum uh, on the outskirts of, of Denver. Uh, are you familiar with that at all? Or, I'm no, I, I haven't, was on the site actually of haven't Lowry. been there. Um, I haven't been able to go back there. I remembered how disappointed I was that Lowry was going to totally close. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, I guess they've got the museum and there's some other things that the city has done with the property right. that was very substantial. Mm -hmm. I mean, the property was. Okay. Uh, now was four years about as long as the Air Force normally keeps somebody someplace? Or? Um, most people would move within three years, mm -hmm. but I was fortunate to have four years in Omaha and then four years you know, the, uh, f four years in Hawaii, and I came when I, and after I left Denver for the second time, I went to Omaha again, 
and they let me stay there six years because for my first marriage, uh, I had a daughter who was uh, going into high school and I said, I'd, I said, I'd really like to stay until she graduates. Mm -hmm. They tried to take me to Louisiana once and I said, you know, I'd rather not. And so for some reason I was able to talk into my, talk my uh, personnel monitor mm -hmm. into keeping me at Omaha. So mm -hmm. it was in, so we stayed in Omaha from 87 to 93. All right. Now, was your job in Omaha this time, I mean, how was it different from the previous one? Uh, this time I was an officer and I actually managed my own branch. Uh, I arrived there just as I was achieving captain, uh, the rank of captain. And so I got my own branch and we, um, we were primarily responsible for watching um, Soviet uh, strategic weaponry. Um, in fact, mostly land-based and air. Um, we did a little bit of work with the nuclear submarine fleet, mm -hmm. uh, but it was mostly land and air-based nuclear weaponry that we were monitoring on imagery. And then we had a sister branch next to us that, w that performed all source analysis using our information plus other forms of intelligence that they could get their hands on in order to write a more complete report. Okay. Now, are you doing this uh, during the period when the Cold War is ending and the Soviet um, Union? Actually, the Cold War ended while I was there. Yeah. Um, in 1990, um, I, I have to back up. Okay. Uh, my second marriage was falling apart as I was in Denver. Mm -hmm. And so we got a divorce there. And about a year later, I remarried. And, and my third wife and I moved to Omaha. Mm -hmm. So about a year and a half, no, maybe, maybe just a year into my tour there, my squadron commander to, came to me and said, how's your marriage? <laughs> And I said, it's great, why? <laughs> said, well, I have a job for you. So I became an indications and warning officer, pulling rotating 12-hour shifts down in the bowels of SAC headquarters. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, I'm still married There mm -hmm. was, uh, to the same woman. This is 31 years later almost. Okay, so third time was a charm. Right. Third time was a charm. Um, th that's another story altogether that we, don't, we won't go into in this format, I guess. But um, we're very much in love. It's been almost 31 years, like I said. So at that point, I became an indications and warning officer, and I, was, I did that for about 20 months. And then I came out of that job, if you will, into, back into JSTPS, which is the agency that I was involved with when I was enlisted the first mm -hmm. time at Omaha. So, uh, I went back to JSTPS and went back into the targeting cell, and I, that was 1990, late 1990, mm -hmm. and, then, and then in 1993, I finished my tour in Omaha and we went to the Pentagon. Now, did the uh, end of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union, did that have impacts on the targeting and what you were looking at or where things were? Not at first. Um, I, was, uh, I, was in the, uh, I was in the Indications and Warning Center when the wall came down. I was also in the Indications and Warning Center when Just Cause uh, kicked off, which was the operation that uh, involved Panama mm -hmm. and capture, capturing Noriega. Right. And um, so those kinds of things um, uh, those kinds of things cropped up while I was down there. In, in addition, a name you may be familiar with, James Clapper, mm -hmm. who was the director of uh, Central Intelligence until the Trump administration. Um, he was my boss. He was the chief of intel for SAC mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, so um, interesting. You know, interesting relationships developed over time. All right. Now, the Gulf War also goes on during this time, because that's 91. Indeed. Uh, I have an interesting story about that, too. 
we were, uh, the JSTPS, the first letter is J for joint. And so I was directly supervised by, an Air For or by a Marine Lieutenant Colonel, and his boss was an Air Force Colonel. And so the, uh, when the Gulf War kicked off, he was frustrated because he was stuck in this assignment that he had to stay in for X number of years. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I'd love to go play in the sand with my brothers. Mm -hmm. So I, I talked to the Air Force Colonel and I talked to an Air Force Captain who was in the same branch. And we went to, uh, we went to the Secretariat, which is our personnel office for the division we were in. And we dummied up a set of orders for this Marine <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel and uh, sending him sending him to Kuwait. So, so we pulled that one on him. <laughs> and the, the only indicator he had that the orders were not what they should be was, uh, was the signature at the bottom, which, which was signed by a petty officer I Ben had. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he saw the, they have a, a series of numbers and letters for the fund site or the source of payment for this right. and for these orders and he was uh, that tweaked his that tweaked his curiosity a little bit and then he saw the signature and he i mean i mean the colonel gave him the orders <laughs> and he was like oh my god oh my god oh we got a pack oh what are we going to do with the house blah, 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 blah. and he was all uh he was all animated about it and then we figured out that we put one over on him he was he smiled, but I know he was steaming inside. Mm -hmm. I've known other Marines, and that that would upset them. Now that that kind of gets down to that's about your your next to last assignment. Was that one in Omaha? Uh, that was my next to the last. Um, I decided that if I was going to earn another promotion, I had to do it at the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and my assignment monitor agreed, and so we went we were reassigned to Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, I served in the Pentagon until, well, from, you know, summer of 93 until December of 95. Uh, I did not get promoted. Um, and one of the reasons was that I had not achieved my master's degree yet, and that was a box that every officer needed to check mm -hmm. uh, in order to continue the promotions. And the other was, this was in the Clinton administration when, uh, in general, the forces were being drawn down and they didn't need me anymore. Mm -hmm. However, I had a friend who was a retired colonel and worked for one of the uh, Beltway contracting companies. Mm -hmm. And he not only mentored me through the transition process of retirement, uh, he also hired me. And, uh, and so I worked for that company for 17 years uh, after I retired. Okay. And then after that, we moved to Michigan with another job opportunity. All right, so that 17 years with the contractor, what were you doing? I, was, I went back to the Pentagon <clears throat> to work on uh, major requirements documents, Air Force policy documents, uh, concepts of operations, et cetera, et cetera having all this experience and being a pretty good technical writer, I, I, I drafted uh, memos, I drafted you know, 50, 60, 80 page documents for the Air Force and uh, for, you know, for general officer approval, et cetera. And I was actually in the Pentagon when 9-11 hit, uh, assigned to the Pentagon. I had just left at nine o'clock. Was it just, was it nine o'clock? Yeah, no, 8.30, I left and, and went down the road about three miles to another client's office. And when I arrived there, he was, he was on the phone with a brother on Wall Street who said, turn on your TV, they've hit the towers. And so we turned on his TV just in time to see the second airplane hit, mm -hmm. what, the South Tower, I think. Yeah. And, and as we were watching that, we had another alert that an airplane had crashed into the Pentagon, which was opposite where I would have been. However, uh, my friends who were still in the Pentagon felt the impact mm -hmm. 
smelled the smoke. The Pentagon was just full of acrid blue smoke. And um, it was about two days before I could get back into the building. And when I got back, and as a contractor, I did not have as free access as the military did. Right. But when I was able to get back in, um, everybody had their head down and it was like they were so determined and they wanted to make somebody pay. Mm -hmm. And so I became involved with the planning effort for the incursion into Afghanistan. Uh, we set up a macro communications network because by this time our reconnaissance aircraft were flying over Southwest Asia or able to fly over Southwest Asia and transmit their imagery back to Virginia for mm -hmm. analysis. It was all digital by that point. Yeah. And so we set up the macro network um, and uh, uh, an interesting story again when I was at the Pentagon before I retired uh, I mentioned the Predator mm -hmm. to you earlier. Uh, it's the same air, same unmanned aircraft that fires the Hellfire missiles. At that point, the Air Force was experimenting with the Predator as a reconnaissance platform. And my job as an officer on the staff was to manage the ground station operations or to staff that and facilitate the ground station operations for the aircraft. So I was involved with the Predator from the time it was first demonstrated until it went operational, the September before I retired. And, and it touched my heart that the, um, that the Predator was bed down for its first operational assignment in Nevada and their squadron designation was the 11th reconnaissance squadron mm -hmm. which was my reconnaissance squadron back in thailand i right. said how poetic mm -hmm. i've been in deeply involved with this program and now they're taking they're taking one of my operational unit assignments or unit designators as their own okay uh now uh while you know was the contractor you were working with were they mostly kind of telecommunications stuff or um the contract involved a lot of things uh, telecommunications, signals intelligence, imagery intelligence, all source, uh, all source intelligence. There, it they were uh, had a very broad reach across the DoD and the intelligence community. And my job with them was to be a consultant mm -hmm. to the Air Force, and then later to one of the national agencies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, did that work also then extend uh, to Iraq when we went in there, or? Was um, some of it did. It was more. In, it was more. Uh, it, it was more the nature of planning, mm -hmm. and there were a few contractors who actually went to Kuwait, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, for well, for the original Gulf War, and there were also when I was with the company uh, contractors who. Uh, went into Iraq mm -hmm. and into Afghanistan uh, to some of the central bases to manage facilities for which we were responsible. In fact, we installed some hardware and communications in some locations a as a company. Okay. So it's the kind of thing that in, in, in previous eras military personnel would have been doing. Yes, indeed. We, um, the government, the, the DOD, the intel community, and the uh, lower units among the services would all hire contractors to, to be a force multiplier. Mm -hmm. These people aren't, these, these people don't, get, don't go into battle, but they can help us plan for it. And they can manage our units when we send people into battle. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of keeping the overall size of the military down while we're not officially there and part of it. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. All right. Uh, and now, so you do that, okay, for, so for 17 years? That's correct. Okay. Um, other kind of highlights or things that stand out for you from that um, kind of job? One of the things that stood out to me specifically was a, uh, 
rapid acquisition effort that we accomplished as a part of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, the other agency that I mentioned that I was supporting. My government program manager had a team of seven contractors, and as contractors, we helped him uh, deploy. We used Northrop Grumman, we used uh, SPAWAR, which is uh, uh, Space and Naval Warfare uh, Agency. Um, we used um, Pierce Manufacturing up in Appleton, Wisconsin. We used a variety of vendors and outside support. We coordinated that effort until we sent over a hundred million dollars worth of computing and telecommunications equipment into uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, over a period of one year, we, uh, we managed the integration of a major command vehicle for that agency and the initial deployment of the computing and telecommunications equipment. I was especially proud of that because um, nobody said we could do it, number one. Um, Number two, nobody said we could, and the ones who thought we could said we couldn't do it within the budget we had. And so it was, that was probably one of the most fulfilling times as a contractor that I had. So we, uh, and, and that was the last thing I did before I actually became a program manager for that same image, that, uh, for the company mm -hmm. supporting that agency. So I had two different program management jobs before I left the company and we came here. Okay, so when did you come to Michigan? 2014. Okay. Um, there was a two year point there where I was actually out of work um, due to due the sequestration, which uh, some people don't understand as a term, but it was essentially a mandatory uh, funding cutbacks. Mm -hmm. um, I was senior, I was a program manager, I was making more money than the, than the company wanted to pay me and because of all the cutbacks, mm -hmm. they laid me off. Mm -hmm. So two years later, I have, I have exhausted my 401k, I'm living on my Air Force pension and getting close to Social Security time. And the job became available in Grand Rapids. Okay. And so we moved here uh, for that. Mm -hmm. um, it, was an interesting time. Eventually that work ran out and the timing was perfect because we met some horse owners at a major event over in Ionia and began to discuss, my wife and I began to discuss with them what they do as opposed to what we do and they said we need your services and so we started our company. So what does your company do? Sea Grace Productions is a multimedia service company for horse owners and related businesses. Um, they call me the camera cowboy, you know, kind of a takeoff on my name, which mm -hmm. means cowboy. Um, and I'm a content creator, and my wife is a director, uh, producer, editor. She also understands multimedia uh, in terms of social media. And so we provide consultation services and video services to horse owners, for instance, when they want to market their, when they want to market their stock, when they, mm -hmm. want, to, when they want to have a keepsake of a horse that is getting older and they know they won't be with them much longer, things like that. We, uh, right now, we specifically focus on Frisian horses uh, developed in the Netherlands and imported here in the 70s into Michigan in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we have developed connections there and we're actually developing a documentary on the versatile Frisian, mm -hmm. which WKTV will uh, broadcast sometime next year. All right, okay. Uh, now as you think back over your career in the service, um, in this I usually ask people, you know, how do you think your time in the service affected you or what did you take out of it? But of course it was your career. Uh, but do you have kind of a, you know, kind of summary statement or if you say, well, what, was, what did it mean to me? What do you say? Well, I wouldn't be where I am today without it. Um, I appreciated the discipline on one hand. On the other hand, I was, 
I was quite the creative when I was younger, and I felt some of that was stifled over time. But um, I am now doing creative work again, which is exciting to me. I wouldn't trade any of my Air Force experiences for anything in the world. Um, I've, I, I have developed an eternal perspective on that, uh, on what I've been through. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it was all part of God's plan to put me where I am today. And I'm a pretty happy guy now. All right. Well, it makes for very good and certainly an unusual story. So thanks for taking the time for sharing it today. You're quite welcome, Jim.